When we talk about Jackie Robinson, most of what we discuss surrounds his breaking of baseball's color barrier, his athletic accomplishments in that season, the bravery as he faced unrestrained racism, and his ability to turn the other cheek while not backing down. But Robinson's life and legacy is so much more than what happened in that mythologized year. What was he like before he changed Major League Baseball? And after that momentous season, what was he like both on the field and in his post-playing career? In a little while, we'll get to know the younger Jackie Robinson with someone who knew and competed against him before he was a professional athlete. But let's start this discussion by learning about what shaped Jackie Robinson the person before his big league debut and what was important to him after he stepped away from the field. To help expound on this, we've enlisted the help of two Robinson scholars. Dr. Raymond Doswell is the Vice President of Curatorial Services for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And Dr. Michael Long is the author and editor of a new collection of essays on Jackie Robinson, 42 Today. Let's let's dive in, gentlemen, like right from Jackie Robinson pre how we know him breaking the color barrier and in baseball and what it was like for him as an athlete, um, you know, as he was leaving UCLA and deciding to play professional baseball. So, as I understand, you know, Robinson is a multi-sport athlete um, inspired by his brother. Uh, who was an Olympian, uh, would come along and in his scholastic days really top his brother's athletic feats in many respects as a track and field star. Um, many high school and AAU records would fall uh, as Robinson was very good at the broad jump in particular uh, and enjoyed many sports, uh, went to the junior college, uh, and played uh, a number of sports there at Pasadena Junior College, um, playing baseball, track and field, dabbling basketball. Uh, well, I understand was a very good tennis player as well. The only thing he couldn't do well was swim, which was um, actually, uh, as his daughter Sharon Robinson told me, really relates to the fact that African Americans weren't allowed to use the public pools. Uh, so he never really took up swimming. Uh, and uh, that was something that, uh, not that he was afraid to try, but that uh, something, a skill that he never learned because of segregation for the most part. So, uh, but he could do anything uh, and was a tenacious athlete at best. Um, played a lot of the sports, played them well, played football in particular, uh, did suffer a number of injuries, especially ankle injuries in particular that limited him in other ways later on in life, um, especially when he got to the military in terms of uh, getting an opportunity to go and actually fight in the European theater. His injuries kind of slowed him down in terms of getting those opportunities. But uh, as we learn, he did fight to be part of the officer's training uh, school uh, when he was stationed uh, after college at Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, the 1st Infantry, uh, which is near Kansas City. Um, fought to get into the officer's training school, was rebuffed uh, by his superiors initially. Uh, he and other Black soldiers who wanted that opportunity, but another young soldier came along uh, to help. And But it, this was not someone that was unfamiliar to the entire Army, and that was boxer Joe Lewis, uh, who came to Fort Riley, helped shake up some things for him, uh, and those other officers, and they got that opportunity, and then uh, he he was able to do that, uh, and um, then go on and get transferred to Fort Hood, Texas. But even before that, in the military, he played other sports as well. He played football for the military, ran into a lot of issues uh, where some other teams would didn't want to play against him or have him be on the field because of his race. Um, as I understand it, and uh, Dr. Long can correct me if I get the timeline incorrect, uh, there was a situation, especially he had a, a time where he was stationed in, in Hawaii, uh, also playing football out there. Uh, and there was some, oh, there was some resistance to his playing there. And he had some issues uh, being stationed out in Hawaii, but was transferred back uh, to the to the mainland uh, in early December 1941, just a few days before Pearl Harbor. So he misses Pearl Harbor <laughs> by a few days. Uh, and uh, what well, wouldn't history be quite different without Jackie Robinson had he been involved in that battle? But um, his athleticism 
took them to different places in the army and took them to different places across the country. And after um, he left the military, he he looked for opportunities to work. Um, that included um, at a, a black college in Texas where he was willing to work as a coach and athletic director uh, there, but the Negro Leagues, as well as the major leagues, were depleted during the war as far as uh, uh, needing baseball players. Uh, many were drafted uh, to the war, and the Kansas City Monarchs in particular had lost a lot of big talent, including Buck O'Neill and some others. So there were job opportunities in the Negro Leagues, and um, he needed a job, and the opportunity was there for him, and he took it and got a chance to play in the infield with the Kansas City Monarchs in 1945. But I want to go back to the military service a little bit. Mike, Mike, you can weigh in this as well, because one of the things that stood out from what Mr. Chappelle said is part of Robinson's legacy in that, I don't know, for lack of a better term, it doesn't sound like he suffered fools, which I certainly can appreciate. And he was not going to be somebody, as, as Mr. Chappelle said, was going to be run over. How did that treat him in something that is as structured and certainly was as segregated as the military was in the forties. And how did that serve as a guiding principle for him in his post baseball career? So Robinson faced a court martial when he was in the army. And part of that reason stems from his refusal to move to the back of a bus when directed to do so by a driver who thought that Robinson was sitting next to a white woman who was actually a light-skinned uh, Black American whose husband was also an officer in the army. And the two exchanged words, the driver and Robinson, they exchanged words and the driver ended up reporting him to the military police. And Robinson exchanged words with the military police as well, as you might imagine. And a few of them, as I understand it, hurled the N-word at him. And it, because he had a short fuse, but also because he was full of dignity about the color of his skin, uh, he refused to back down. And he was brought up on charges eventually. And he was acquitted of those charges. He had a great attorney. And uh, he, Robinson kept his back straight throughout that whole trial and was acquitted. He didn't suffer fools in the military. That's only one example. But it's the most uh, colorful example, I think, because he was court-martialed. But yeah, uh, he faced a lot of racism in the military. There were teams who refused, as we heard, uh, who refused to play with him. There uh, were military teams who refused to let him play on their team. There were officers who uh, hurled the N-word at him. And Robinson, I think, was very glad when he uh, received an honorable discharge from the military and he didn't serve in the European theater and he never expressed regret for not having gone to the European theater. Uh, the trips that he was in charge with of uh, ended up going to the Norway beach for that land, particular landing. Uh, I think that what was driving his own sense of dignity throughout the military and then throughout the rest of his life especially in post-baseball years, was his sense that the color of his skin was a mark of divine blessing. This is something that his mother had taught him. She taught him that Adam and Eve were originally black, and then they were scared white. They were scared pale when God caught Eve eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, And she taught him that God's original plan for humanity was a, a people with the black skin as their color. So he grew up thinking that he had divinely ordained skin and he would wear uh, white starred shirts to UCLA to accentuate the color of his skin. And he really saw it as a mark of blessing. And I think he took that spiritual lesson as well as the, another lesson that he learned from his mother, and that is that freedom is something to be grasped here, not something to be uh, sought after in the heaven and sweet by and by, but something to be fought for here. He took those two lessons about the importance of the color of his skin, about the importance of fighting for freedom here and now. And he used those lessons as he made his way through a segregated military, then through a segregated Negro leagues, and then through uh, the racism that he experienced in baseball and beyond. 
Ray, we, we, we obviously know a great deal about both the story and the mythology that has come as a result of following you know, Jackie Robinson joining, well, first the Dodgers organization in 46 and then coming to the major leagues in 1947. But in the aftermath, after 1947, there is not, it seems, as much attention on Jackie's story and how it changed. I know when talking to you, one of the things that stood out to you was the, the uh, records of the steel of home for him. What did that signify as he became, you know, it, as really he changed in a lot of respects, the way the major leagues were played with a, a far more intelligent and aggressive style of baseball than had been played before. Or was it in this sense that what, the, the player that Robinson was often compared to, at least certainly by his general manager, Branch Rickey, uh, and a few other commentators, was Ty Cobb. Hmm. Uh, Cobb was seen as equally aggressive as a player, but their careers, uh, there's a gap of about 30, 40 years between their careers. And so in some respects, uh, and, and, and for some people, ironically, that Robinson's aggressive style of play, which included uh, base stealing and aggressive base running, um, uh, was seen as a throwback to Cobb in many respects, uh, which was a high compliment. I mean, Cobb is one of the greatest players of all time, no matter what you think of his social attitudes and things like that. That was a that was a high compliment for him. Uh, and but no one had been as aggressive as stealing home plate since Cobb. Now, what we know from uh, great sites like uh, Baseball Reference and, and Baseball Almanac and Retrosheet.org is that you, when you chronicle st steals of home, they're just included normally with stolen base totals. You don't see them parsed out. So you have to go back and look at the box scores and the, and the newspaper articles to see when the players still stole home. And Retrosheet.org notes that he stole home 19 times. Um, successfully out of about 30 plus attempts of stealing home, which is a very good percentage. Um, and that's throughout his career with a lot of that coming in the early part of his career between 1947 and 1949 and 49 being the MVP season in which he, he compiled. Now for me, um, we know the story uh, or the often told story of uh, Branch Rickey uh, employing Robinson to, especially for the first few seasons, be careful. We know you're going to get taunts. You know you're going to be uh, called names, and you know all these things are going to happen to you, but try not to fight back if you can. Try to have the strength not to fight back, uh, and then after uh, a few seasons, we'll let you loose, and you can do what you want, and again, someone who doesn't suffer fools lightly, someone who's an aggressive former football player, uh, who I describe as a blunt instrument of athleticism, uh, <laughs> uh, can, can, can beat you in so many ways, and he was in my, in my opinion, uh, his aggressive play was a form of resistance to, to the, 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 the social um, abuse that he would take uh, in many respects. And so it was his way of fighting back through his athleticism. And the steal of home was uh, his great weapon. And Jonathan Igg, uh, one of Robinson's biographers, called, called it a, a great weapon for him to use. And he was just very successful at it. And it just really frustrated pitchers. It frustrated opponents. Um, and he had just had such great success at it. He was very adept at it. And again, he stole 19 in his career. Um, now, by comparison, you did have a, 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 a teammate a, a year before, Pete Reeser, who had, was very prolific at stealing home. Uh, but no one had seen that kind of aggressive play since Cobb. Uh, and there were other contemporaries um, um, like Ben Chapman, who was a little bit older than him, who was a good bait, home plate stealer, but he was really the, the best at it. And not until after him, the next player on that list is Rod Carew. Uh, so and there's another gap of time between Rod Carew and, and Jackie Robinson's career. So it was just, it's the most aggressive, you, you can argue it's the most aggressive uh, offensive play that you can have in baseball is to steal home. And he was, he was the master at it. It, it really sets into to 
I think, context how difficult 1947 must have been for him because it was so, you know, he was such a, um, you know, again, as you mentioned, an aggressive player, but he was somebody who was going to stand up for his rights and how he had to take a level of abuse that no one in professional baseball had taken and very few public figures had taken and understanding. And I think Mike, in, in your, your you know, new book, there is one of the essays talks about, how there was very little support for Robinson among his teammates in 47, despite the fact that what history has shown, because the league viewed it as a great experiment. And he had to understand that this was, there was a significant amount of pressure on him. How did that evolve once he was successful and Larry Doby integrates the American league and you start to see more black players in 48, 49 come into the big leagues. How did Robinson change to be more his authentic self than the one that Ricky implored him to be what, as he was breaking the color barrier? Uh, so a couple of things. 1947 was a really tough year for Robinson, as you might imagine. One of his Negro League uh, teammates said that he had a temper like a rattlesnake. He was not naturally nonviolent. He was not a Peace, he did not have a peaceful personality. He was somebody, as Mr. C hinted at, who was always ready to strike back. And he was that way in 1947. You can only imagine the pressure that he felt inside as he faced so much racism from other players and as he faced loneliness also on the Brooklyn Dodgers. You know, the great experiment almost failed when the Dodgers played the Phillies and there's that great scene in the N42 where Ben Chapman is, is uh, delivering every word you might imagine that's a negative word toward Robinson. And so are the Phillies in the bench. And Robinson says at that point that he really did feel like throwing the bat down and walking over to that bench and using his, what he calls his despised black fist to pummel those white sons of you know what's into the ground. That's how he felt when the Phillies were abusing him. And I can't imagine that's the only time Robinson felt that way in 47. So he was facing some really inner turmoil at that point. The Dodgers weren't especially helpful early in 47. Uh, it was a lonely time with him for him. Uh, teammates weren't rallying around him. You know, he got the number 42. It was a really high number. Number four was available. Number two was available. But he got number 42. Uh, he took it as a challenge. You know, he made a number out of 42. We didn't know it before Robinson. We sure as heck know what 42 means now. Uh, but yeah, that was a lonely year for him. When he starts to straighten his back, as he puts it in his 1972 autobiography, when he starts to straighten his back, he says, uh, supporters really started to peel away from him. Uh, news media started to give him a hard time. But I'll let Ray pick up from here, 48, 49, and then how Robinson acted after he started to straighten his back. Ray, you want to talk to that a little bit? Well, once he got an opportunity to kind of let go, so to speak, he was very aggressive, um, not afraid to uh, purposely lay down that bunt to run that pitcher down if he was trying to cover first, uh, certainly was outspoken. Uh, he had a lot going on, too. In addition to things on the field, uh, the 49 season in particular was very interesting, just the summer of July alone. Uh, the month of July alone, he gets picked for the, the All-Star Game, first African-American to play in the All-Star Game, along with Larry Doby uh, and, and other Black players uh, to play in the All-Star Game. He goes before the, the Senate um, uh, or the House uh, uh, Un-American Affairs Committee uh, as well, and testifies in Washington, D.C., gets into this kerfuffle with the great Paul Robeson, so to speak, over communism and what that means and uh, for Black Americans. Um, but he's having a, a stellar career stealing home plate, um, uh, coming into his own as a player and as a leader of the team, uh, leading through an MVP season, uh, and not afraid to speak his mind about many different issues. In some respects, um, uh, um, stealing his back, 
uh, becoming a leader of the team, getting the respect of his white teammates, not afraid to criticize, at least privately and sometimes publicly, his black teammates like Campanella and others and other black players who were didn't seem to be uh, as vocal in terms of issues uh, with civil rights. Um, uh, and then, of course, at the end of the season, uh, starts to make a movie about his life <laughs> uh, in the Jackie Robinson story. So uh, his 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 stardom grows, his fame grows, his prominence grows, uh, and yet, and still, in some respects, he's still a lonely person, uh, 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 being uh, the lone black superstar in baseball, but other great black players are starting to come into the scene. And soon enough, you see the Willie Mazes, and again, Campanella begins to assert his prominence as a great player. Uh, and uh, Monty Irvin is doing well uh, with the Giants. And the Dodgers are, are doing well as a team, although they, for a while, obviously can't get over the hump of trying to beat the New York Yankees, which is the albatross they, they've got to, to slay, so to speak. I, I want to. I don't want to skip over the necessarily the end of Robinson's career. Although, do I do think one of the great last acts of defiance he has is refusing the trade to the Giants, right? And that in that he decides that he would rather retire than play um, for for the Giants at that point. But his post baseball career is so fascinating, and I think the first my first read on it was probably in boys of summer you know reading roger khan and and you get this image of him as the businessman right he opened a bank in harlem um he was prominent in, in new york politics but there were some significant shifts in the way robinson viewed things after his playing career was over he was a very staunch republican for at least the first part of his post playing life and and mike maybe you can take us through some of what began to evolve in Robinson's beliefs as he went from you know, the, the early 60s when he was supporting Nixon against Kennedy to what happened in the 64 Republican convention and beyond? Sure. Uh, first, I know that's a lot. I just gave you a lot. To get to, so. <laughs> first, first, I'll note that if Robinson believed that he was much more aggressive after he left baseball than he was when he was in baseball, which is pretty amazing given what we talked about just a little bit earlier about stealing home plate and so forth. He actually says, I think I've become more aggressive after leaving baseball. Hmm. Uh, he also believed that his, all the exploits on the baseball diamond didn't compare to what he did after baseball. After baseball, he focused on business, he focused on civil rights, he focused on politics and economics, and he, he put his fingertips in all of those areas. 1956, he wins the Spingarn Medal from the NAACP. This is the annual award for a Black person who's affected national life. And Robinson wins that award. He becomes active with the NAACP from 56 on, really active. And then in 1960, he really jumps into politics by backing Richard Nixon. Uh, he does, he backs Richard Nixon because Nixon is a fiercely anti-communist and so is Robinson. Uh, Nixon says to Robinson that he'll move faster on civil rights than Ike Eisenhower ever did. Uh, Nixon steered passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Bill through Congress. So in Robinson's mind, Nixon has a much stronger record on civil rights than JFK does. He also meets JFK in a Georgetown parlor uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And he says later that JFK never once looked him in the eye. And for Robinson, that's a huge thing. Uh, and Rachel recounted that for me. And that was a huge thing for her too when Jack told her about that. So he backs Nixon. He backs him in part because of his civil rights, right? 1964 comes along, who's the candidate? It's Barry Goldwater. Get Barry Goldwater is all about states' rights. Barry Goldwater is not about uh, campaigning for black votes either. Uh, in 1961, he says, in Arizona, we should go hunting where the ducks are. And by that, he means we should really focus on uh, whites in the South who are now disaffected with the Democratic Party. Let's go after them. And that becomes the Southern strategy. And, and, and Robinson is no fan of the Southern strategy. Robinson is a registered independent. 
was a registered independent in 60, 64, 68, and so forth. He believes in what we call the two parties, what he called the two party system, that black voters should suspend their votes and go with whichever candidate and whichever party will boast, will best advance civil rights. He does this throughout his life. And so he goes from backing Nixon to backing Hubert Humphrey, to backing LBJ, and then to backing Hubert Humphrey. In between, his favorite politician of all was Nelson Rockefeller, a progressive Republican who is really progressive on civil rights. So Robinson steered toward Republican politics. He did that because he was socially conservative and fiscally conservative, but he wanted his Republican politicians to be progressive on civil rights. So he liked Rockefeller. He liked George Romney in Michigan. Here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, he liked Bill Scranton. Those are tough Republicans to find anymore, but those were the Republicans that, that Jack really rallied around. If he didn't find one of those Republicans, then he rallied around somebody like Hubert Humphrey or progressive uh, Democrats like LBJ and so forth. Uh, that's how he evolved politically, but consistently, consistently, he backed a two-party system. And here I'm just talking about politics. Mm -hmm. I'm not really addressing uh, his broader campaign for civil rights. Yeah, so the the broader civil rights campaign, and I, I guess this is you know this is a major focus, I think, Mike, in your book. But Ray, I would like to get your your take on this as as well as a curator of of a museum and and on black history. Robinson today, many of the same things that he was fighting for in the '60s and up until his death in '72, are still issues that have been unresolved. I, I don't want to necessarily put words into what Jackie Robinson might think today, but what of the standards that that he laid would he do you think he would be most engaged in supporting at this point? Or what does the history tell us about what it would still be important to Robinson now? Well, that's that's a heavy question um, in some yeah. respects. I, I think it's it's fair to say just getting slightly back to baseball um, on this is that we know that at the end of his life, he was, and he'd said so publicly, really wanted to make sure that there was greater African-American participation in baseball, and particularly in leadership uh, at baseball on the managerial side. And of course, in the, in the offices and the front offices and things like that, he was very outspoken about that uh, and was very hopeful uh, that those opportunities would come for African Americans, especially by the time of his death in the 70s. Uh, there had been a number of players and there had been a number of folk who had proven that they could, they had the baseball acumen to do quite well. I mean, I think even he had aspirations of being a manager himself uh, or, or hopeful for being a manager himself after his baseball career ended. Um, and unfortunately, here uh, in baseball, as as uh, experts like Dr. Richard Lapchick measures that we're still hovering around eight to 10% uh, participation of African-Americans in the sport itself. Um, and so what does that do uh, to reflect on the, the values of what baseball projects towards uh, the, the current issues of today? Fortunately, MLB seems to be listening more to its current and former black players in terms of of, of the issues that, that many of those issues that we were facing last summer, as well as more current issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the all-star game being in Georgia and the voting rights issues and things like that. I think Robinson would be, would be very pleased with uh, the, the conclusions that have been reached there and would be pleased with the activism of these current and former players in terms of bringing awareness through their platforms uh, to many of the issues that have gone on. It's a little bit more difficult when there's only eight to 10% of that population making those calls, but folks are listening now because many of these issues are so out in front uh, for everyone in the community and everyone in society that it's, it's beyond time for folks to listen. And I think uh, the fact that black players in particular are finding a voice uh, is something that Robinson would be very proud of. 
Mike, before you answer on that, I just want to say, Ray, it's pretty incredible that a group like the Players Alliance, which has only been really in organized existence for a short time, has already had such a significant impact. Now, it helps that a member of the Players uh, Players Alliance is also the executive director of the Players Association, I'm sure, but players, former players like Curtis Granderson and Edwin Jackson, um, who have helped to drive this have certainly, and, and Doug Glanville have certainly helped to get the attention of the league office where for years and years, it never felt like it was the equality was a front burner priority, let's say. And I think that their, their voice being heard and the fact that the, the league has been willing to consult with them is a very significant change. It is significant. I think it's fair to say I want to give Major League Baseball credit, at least on one front, and just a participation issue. And uh, they, they're very sensitive to that and wanting to make as many inroads as they can, especially in our urban communities, to try to build up uh, African-American participation in the game and African-American interest in the game. And uh, we all point to the, the growth of the urban academies around the country uh, as, as probably the centerpiece of that effort. Uh, but if you're not at the table, then it's hard to have your voice heard. And the issues, especially in 2020, were just so, uh, outrageous in so many respects that um, you needed voices to be heard uh, to understand the gravity of the issues. And uh, um, I'm hope the black players have seized this moment uh, and MLB fortunately is listening and as as well as many other sports leagues are listening to their African-American players and folks who are really impacted by these things on a daily basis and come out of these communities. Uh, it's, it's, it's long past time that they listen. Uh, kudos to the Players Alliance for their efforts. Uh, and again, I, I really do think that Robinson would be proud of the efforts they've made so far. Mike, away from baseball to the more aggressive phase of Jack Robinson's life, how would he view what is happening today in light of how uh, how he tried to live his life and what he fought for from you know 1957 to the end of his life in the early 70s? So let's just stick with the theme of Robinson not being a pacifist and not being uh, nonviolently inclined. Uh, Robinson was a victim of police brutality several times in his life. Uh, started when he was just a young person in Pasadena and then extended to late in his life when he was uh, going into the Apollo Theater at one point in Harlem and a police officer stuck a gun in his ribs. He knew what police brutality was like and he spoke against police brutality several times in his life. And this is important to remember, especially as we head into Jackie Robinson Day this year, when we are once again talking about police brutality in the George Floyd case, especially. Uh, near, in 1970, this is really fascinating to me. Robinson aligned himself with the Black Panther Party and the Black Panthers were facing charges of using force against police officers. And there was a terrible case of police brutality in New York and the Black Panthers defended themselves. And Robinson came to their defense and he said it was understandable that some Black people would resort to force when they faced police officers who weren't protecting them. Robinson had this belief for a long time. In 1963, for example, he went to Birmingham, Alabama. This is part of uh, Dr. King's campaign at the time. King invited him to come to Birmingham. And this was the scene where uh, Bull Connor, who was the safety commissioner at that point, sick German shepherd dogs on little kids and turned supercharged hoses on those kids in Birmingham as well. And Robinson visits the campaign and he says this about Bull Connor, you can love him if you want to, but I don't think I'm with Dr. King on this. Dr. King was in the audience at the time and he looked a little uneasy according to a reporter. But Robinson had a sense that black people had a right to fight back when police officers weren't defending themselves. In 1963, that same year, a little later, uh, when 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham was bombed, killing four little girls in a church. Robinson was livid. And he says at the time, you know, if one of those girls 
what if one of those girls was my daughter, there's no way I could accept Dr. King's credo and be nonviolent. I would fight back. And that's what Robinson felt. I can't imagine, given all of that, and given his own experiences with police brutality and speaking out against it, that he wouldn't be supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement today. If we look at just the topic of police brutality, Mike, I think that had Robinson's trajectory continued, he would be right there in the thick of Black Lives Matter. Is there anything, gentlemen, that we did not cover here that you think is important to speak about outside of, of, of what we've talked on on Robinson that, that we should make people aware of? Well, since we're in Arizona today, yes. let me just highlight one thing about bipartisanship and reaching across the aisle. Uh, in 1964, Robinson detested Barry Goldwater. He called him a bigot. He thought Goldwater was racist to the core because Goldwater was calling for states' rights. Three years later, two of them meet in Arizona over a breakfast meeting, and then they meet again later in New York. And Goldwater, by this point, is loosening up his call for states' rights, and Robinson is getting a little bit older, and the two of them have a really lovely breakfast together, and they start to talk about these issues of race. And they come to a meeting of minds. They, again, apart ways when it comes to Nixon, Goldwater backs Nixon and, Rock, and Robinson refuses to do so. But they meet together and they become almost friends. It's a great example of partisanship <laughs> and trying to meet together. Rockefeller taught Robinson, it doesn't matter what the past was like, if somebody wants to work with you, work with them. And that's the advice that Robinson took from Rockefeller in reaching out to Barry Goldwater in 1967. It's a beautiful story. I love it. That is a really great one. For, from each of you, is there a favorite, and Ray, I'll start with you, a favorite memory or favorite thing that you've learned about or from Jackie Robinson? I want to answer carefully, make sure, because there's so many different things. Um, I think on the two things, just um, on the one hand, um, in my studies of Robinson, I find it interesting um, how over his career, uh, we, we see him in many respects as a saint of baseball, in many respects, but um, he's, he's a, he is a, but during his career, it was not always that way. Uh, we, we have exalted him in many respects, uh, later in life and later in our memory of him. And, and I won't say that that's not justified. I think he deserves all the accolades he gets. Um, it's interesting to read about his life in contemporary times, both as an athlete and someone as an activist, and how he was, in many respects, scorned. Um, uh, it seemed as if, in, in a lot of respects, a lot of the treatment he got as a star player, uh, when I was reading biographies like Arnold Rampersand's was it reminded me, this is how they, sometimes they treat Barry Bonds <laughs> in many respects. You know, some of the things that he went through and, and how he was looked at. Um, and he was not afraid to use his platform uh, after baseball in particular uh, to speak out on different issues, but sometimes that, that cost him in popularity uh, and, 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 and in some respects cost him res in respect, but that was also part of the evolving nature of in particular the civil rights movement as different leaders with different voices were coming in. Um, and he at least understood perspectives like those of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers and others, but it was still, it came at a crossroads for him in some respects in terms of how people saw him and how he was going to engage the public in many ways. But he was a strong person, uh, strong in his beliefs. Uh, and um, 
was someone who didn't want to back down uh, to, to a fight in many respects. So that's that's the great lesson of Jackie Robinson was that uh, to believe in yourself and be strong in those convictions and um, uh, and and that's what I admire about him most. Uh, but it's interesting just to to look back on him and and he's not unlike many other heroes, especially many heroes in African American history, like Dr. King, who was also vilified in his day, and Malcolm X, who was vilified in his day amongst his contemporaries and amongst many outside the community, and who we have a different perspective on as time has passed us. Mike, for you. Sure, I'll just give you one of my favorite stories as well. Uh, we can't understand Jack Robinson without exploring Rachel Robinson's life and legacy at the same time. So that's an important point that I want all of us to remember. October 24th, 1972, it's early in the morning and Rachel Robinson is in the kitchen making breakfast as she always did every morning. and and. Her husband, Jack, is in the bathroom, he's in the shower, and she hears him call his name, and immediately she knows that something is wrong. And so she stops what she's doing, and she runs into the hallway, and there she meets Jack, who's just come out of the shower. She can sense that something's wrong, and he grabs her and holds onto her tight, and they hug, and he tells her that he loves her, and then he collapses, and he dies of complications from diabetes as well as other things, probably racism as well. And I love that story because it gives us some insight into the bond that those two had. And it was a bond that was really necessary for shattering that baseball barrier in 1947, shattering the color barrier, excuse me, in Major League Baseball in 1947 and then shattering many other barriers throughout their life together. A really beautiful story. I think the, to me, the canonization of figures always misses what's the most interesting about them, which is that they're human, right? And that's the beauty of Jackie Robinson's story is that for all we talk about the, the way he handled racism and the the difficulties that he had that he faced and the way we've sanitized his story over the years the real Jackie Robinson is far more interesting to me because I would feel that same rage I would feel the same emotions that he did and that to me makes it real and somehow makes him stronger in my mind and I think that the stories that, that you guys have shared today certainly help to illustrate exactly how strong a person he is and how important he was and how human Jackie Robinson was so I appreciate you you doing that so thank you Leroy Roscoe Chappelle grew up here in Phoenix his father farmed at the intersection of what is now Central and Glendale Mr. C filmed here just two weeks shy of his 102nd birthday knew Jackie Robinson and competed against him in track and field when both were amateur athletes. Here are his memories. When did you first meet Jack Robinson and his brothers? I met them when I was about 15 or 16 years of age. And uh, at that time, I was trying to prepare for the United States Olympic in high jump. And I'd go over to Los Angeles with friends, visit relatives, and it was there that I met Jackie. Now Jackie later was with the, he was with the Pasadena Junior College, mm -hmm. and I was with the Phoenix Junior College. And uh, he would play, I, he played uh, football, scored seven touchdowns one night, and they took him out of the game. I didn't uh, play football. I was a track man. And uh, I kept up with him down through the years and I was in the service. It's just coincidental. I was in the service, but I was not in his unit, but I kept up with what he was doing. He had problems because he would not let the other recruits, the whites, push him around. And he was always on the edge of being punished. 
he, he beat them up. He could fight as good as any boxer. At that time, he was living in Pasadena. And his family worked for the sanitary department in Garbage. He had an older brother named Mac, M-A-C-K. Mac was preparing for the Olympic in, in the 220. He was a very good athlete. They were all good, that family was. That was Mac and that. And, and there's another brother, I can't recall the name now. But anyway, I got, I got to know him well. And I competed against him only once. And that was in a relay. And uh, I was fortunate to move him out in the center of the track where the mud was. And that gave me a break and I was able to beat him. That's the only time I've ever beat him in his 220. I kept up with him all his life. And I talked with him about, oh, um, two months before he died, he came to visit friends in uh, Oakland. And uh, they went to the Golden Gate racetrack. And I was there. And when they told me he was there and he was asking for me, I went to the main office and I had a chance to talk with him. But he passed away. He had many ailments against him. But he was the most unusual. He's the only man that ever went to UCLA. Was a five-letter man. No one has ever accomplished that big Jackie. But Jackie was very short-tempered. He didn't let anyone push him around. Starting uh, on that that competition. I mean, you, you mentioned that both he and Mac were great athletes. What what was it that made them so unique? Good sprinters, good 220 runners, good 100 yard runners, unusually. Now, of course, uh, Jackie was much more competitive than his brothers, Mac, and the others. Mm. He was an all around athlete, broad jump, high jump, track, tennis, swimming, all around. He just could pick up a the best points in a sport and in large joint. Did you live in Pasadena too, or where did you? Because you went to so you say you went to Phoenix, Phoenix. Junior College. Where did you Phoenix. live in Phoenix? Yeah, yeah. They were uh, there was competition between the two, but because of racism in those days, uh, you had to stay with your group. And I had a uh, friends there that always gave a party for him when he'd come. Now, now he came to uh, to Phoenix with with Pasadena Junior College. He was he pretty well known um, uh, um, among athletes at that point, or was it just because there was a connection with people with Phoenix Junior College that that you were able to have those get-togethers? I'll put it this way: there was a schedule games between the Pasadena JC, Compton JC, and so forth, and he'd come there compete against the Phoenix Junior College. They knew they were going to likely lose before the event was even started. What did you think was his best sport? Football. He was with that group that threw the game, the Rose Bowl game, uh, at the coach's request and threw the, the 1940 football game. At the coach's request, they threw that game. They could have beat Tennessee easily. Of course, that's a long time ago, because I'll have my 102nd birthday, April the 22nd. Ah. So I've been around a few days. <laughs> Mr. Chappelle, thank you so much for, for joining us. This was really wonderful. Some great insight. We, we appreciate you spending time with us um, and, and giving us so many great stories. So thank you. Thank you. And it's great to have you back in Phoenix. 